Okay, talking out loud. Uh, again, thanks for being here. Uh, be mindful of all the times and services are upcoming, and we'll continue in our time of worship. Thank you.
settled, we will join together in singing our hymn of preparation. You can remain seated as we sing the first three verses of Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Amen. I told Beth 
the other day that I was going to tell, I was going to open the sermon with this story. No matter what happened last night, no matter if they win or loss, I was still going to tell this story. And it's only fitting that this is the idea that came to me for this idea of practicing adoration. Now, when I went on my visit of Duke Divinity School during my senior year of undergrad, I actually got to go inside Cameron Indoor Stadium. Now, I've been there before. I've been to a game. I've been walked those halls before, but we did just get to sit in the stands when we went in there. We actually got to walk out onto the court when we were on this tour. I had actually caught myself stopping at the baseline wondering if I should take my shoes off because the place I was about to be standing was holy ground. <laughs> I told some of the choir that this story was going to go over a whole lot better because of the fact that Carolina won last night. But I took a breath, I stepped over the line, and I stood on that same floor of all of these uh, players that I have loved throughout my life. I did not smack the floor like Mo Jones, but I wanted to. But I did, Freddie, if you'll put the picture up there, I did kiss <laughs> when I was there. No, that's the proper push-up technique right there for that picture. I remember walking around on that court just soaking in this place that I had seen on TV forever. I'd been in before, but I was seeing it from a different vantage point. I remember walking up to the free throw line, getting my feet set, and I looked up, and the national championship batters, yes, we don't get to add another one, but enough, all five of those were hanging from behind the basket. And I remember I started weeping profusely, and I had absolutely no idea what was going on with my, with my tear ducts. Must have been bad allergy day or whatever. But whatever it was, somehow all of my fandom, all of my love, all of my adoration came together in one moment that I will remember for the rest of my life. It's why last night was so hard for so many of us, right? We love our schools. We love our basketball programs. We have cheered for them for so long. We have been with them through thick and thin. We know the players. We know their stories. We want, we're right there with them through it all. No matter if your team won or your team lost or your team didn't play at all last night, we are all feeling some type of way this morning because practicing adoration is exhausting. Amen? The word adoration means to have deep love or respect, to worship or venerate. To adore something means to give all of yourself to it. You can care about someone, you can love someone, but when you adore someone, when you adore something, it means that you hang on its every word. Their every move makes you move. Their very breath takes your breath away. Practicing adoration is a sign of respect and honor. To look and recognize that someone, the amount of effort that someone is putting in, the least that we can do is respond with a sign of adoration, a sign of praise or commitment to that individual or group. Practicing adoration means giving all of yourself because if we hold anything back, then our love is truly not unconditional. Obviously, there's a difference between adoring our basketball teams and adoring the Lord. One we love for a few months a year. The other is the giver of every perfect gift. But love can make you do some pretty crazy things from time to time. Like kissing a basketball ball. I'm kind of a German though. Like I have no idea why I did that when I get back to that moment. But also, as we hear in our passage, love makes you offer a gift to another. Offer a gift to the Lord that might just look to others as a little bit crazy. Practicing adoration means giving up your Sunday mornings to sit in a sanctuary and sing songs and hear the word of the Lord read and proclaimed. Practicing adoration means gathering around a table for a meal of thanksgiving where we are also surrounded by the saints that have gone on before us. When we come before the Lord practicing adoration, even when, especially when, the 
world has given us no reason to have it. We are truly showing where our faith really lies. Church, we learn from Mary in our passage today that practicing adoration isn't just a sign of fandom. Practicing adoration isn't about showing up and cheering when the, when the times are good. Rather, practicing adoration means offering to God all that you are, all that you have, because we know that we are nothing without Him in the first place. Throughout this Lenten season, we have been seeing how practice makes perfect. That we were all created to be perfect, but through the ways of the world, the challenges of the flesh, the enticing work of the devil, we are all sinners who have fallen short of the grace of God. But slowly and surely, we are on this journey toward entire sanctification. We will be perfect again one day, and we do that by practicing the things that we should be practicing. Practicing perseverance in the face of temptation. Practicing lament in the face of unspeakable pain. Practicing reflection as we determine what the Lord might be calling us to. Practicing forgiveness with ourselves and with one another. But all of these practices pale in comparison to our practice of adoration. For what is faith if we don't show it? What is love if we do not share it with another? What is adoration if we do not offer it to the one who has blessed us beyond measure? The story in the Gospel of John can be can using for us because it sounds like two or three different stories combined together. I had to take these verses slowly this week to figure out exactly what story it was that we were reading. Now this isn't the story of Martha working and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Nor is this the story of Mary anointing Jesus' head with oil. Rather, this is a story about a celebration following the resurrection of Lazarus. Mary and Martha's brother, Jesus' friend, was dead, and now he is alive again. <clears throat> the least this family could do is practice adoration by offering Jesus a meal. Martha gets to work preparing the meal, as we hear her often do. Mary comes and sits at the feet of Jesus, as she always does. But now, instead of just listening to Jesus teach, we hear that Mary anoints his feet with perfume, an extremely expensive, pure nard. We hear that this perfume is probably worth 300 denarii, which is about a year's worth of wages at this time that she pours out onto Jesus' feet. In our passage, we get this dichotomy, this tension between two types of service, two types of adoration. On one hand, you have Mary and Martha who give all of themselves to Jesus. One cooks, one cleans, they give, give, give. One uses her gifts to offer him food, and the other uses her gifts to anoint him and prepare him for what this next week is going to bring. And on the other side, in this story, we have Judas Iscariot, who claims to believe, who claims to follow, but all we see him do is take Take, take. We hear parenthetically of how Judas, the keeper of the common purse, the chief financial officer of this ministry that Jesus is leading, Judas is embezzling funds from this work. He is skimming off the top. And we hear Judas get mad about the actions that Mary does. He thinks she is wasting money by pouring this perfume on Jesus' feet. You could have sold that perfume, Judas says, and made so much more. I had a larger quantity of money that we could have helped more people with. <clears throat> In reality, we can see that Judas is upset that he doesn't get a cut of that sale for himself. On one side of the story, we have people who practice adoration by giving 
more and more, ultimately all of themselves to Jesus. And on the other side, we have someone who practices adoration by physically being present, but doing nothing but taking what he wants for himself. Throughout our lives, there are lots of extravagant gifts that are put out into the air where they soon evaporate. Our choir labors to prepare a beautiful anthem every week, just like today, and then three or four minutes later, it's gone. But there are some weeks where you all remember the anthem far more than you remember the words that I say in the sermon. At least that happens to me also. The teacher prepares the lesson, stands, and delivers only to have the class be adjourned and go back out into the world. But sometimes that lesson that the teacher preaches could change the course of a student's life. Mourners provide large arrangements of flowers to honor those that they love, those that have died, only to have those flowers wither and die. But in those moments that those flowers show up, we remember their scent. Saints donate large sums of money for the congregations to spend, trusting fully that they are going to use those funds appropriately. We practice adoration in lots of different ways throughout our lives. And our passage today makes us stop and ask, why? Why do we do these things? things. Truthfully, Judas is kind of on to something about this illogical nature of Mary's gift. She could have sold that perfume and made more money that could have helped more people, gain a larger quantity of money that could have helped a larger quantity of people. The money that we put in the offering plate every week, that same amount of money we too could Go and invest it, let it compound, and it could become a larger quantity of money that could ultimately help a larger quantity of people. However, friends, practicing adoration is not about the quantity of the gift, but rather the quality of the gift. The heart that we have behind our gift. We give our tithes and offerings as a sign of adoration because it was God who first gave to us. We give our adoration to, to God because it is the least that we could do for all of the blessings that he has given to us. We practice adoration to God because he first adored us. There are Judases in our lives everywhere that we turn who come and try to diminish our practices of adoration. People who try to tell us that you can spend your time better, spend your money better, spend your love better. But we know that the value of adoration is only found in what is shown. Praise isn't praise unless it is shown faith isn't faith unless we live it out. Love isn't love unless it is shared with another. Mary poured out that perfume on Jesus' feet, and we hear in verse 3 that the house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. Adoration is a gift that keeps on giving it's a gift that keeps on blessing. Adoration has a scent that will make the heads and hearts of those who are still coming to believe turn and wonder, what are those people at Goldstein up to? No matter how big or how small your practice of adoration might be, you should know that if your heart is in the right place, then God will receive it with great thanksgiving. As we turn our hearts and minds these next couple of weeks from Lent into Holy Week and ultimately to Easter, we recognize how quickly our acts of adoration today 
Our cries of praise next Sunday on Palm Sunday are going to turn into cries of crucify him on Good Friday. The slippery slope it is that leads from Mary to Judas. Friends, might we stay faithful? Might we stay in love with God? Might we practice adoration even in our darkest of days? For we know and believe and proclaim this morning that we are nothing without the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And so adoration is the least that we could do. Amen? Amen. Amen. As we transition now into a time of prayer, let's continue to be in prayer for our nation and our world and all of our leaders. We continue to be in prayer for all of our sisters and brothers in the Russia-Ukraine area. We continue to be in prayer for Gray Moody, who continues to have a good week. This week, things continue to progress in the right direction. Continue prayers for him. Continue prayers for Judson Keck. Same thing, continuing to get better day by day. And there are many other prayer requests that you can find in your bulletin on the little sheet that some of you might have ripped off and you are sharing them with one another. But there's lots more on there. And just a reminder to send in any prayer requests that you have to us during the week so that we can share them with the church family. Are there any other requests that you have, joys, concerns that you would like to share this morning? draw near to those individuals, you draw near to each and every one of us. Strengthen us for the work ahead this week. Help us to be your hands, your feet, your heart in this community. For Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and rise again so that we might have life and life everlasting. Help us to share that life, share that love with everyone that we meet. It's in your heavenly name that we pray. Amen. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Saying, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be in the obedient church. We have not been we have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's all pray. 
Sorry prayers are silent confession. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now as forgiven and reconciled people, I invite you to turn to one another and share signs of peace.
that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, may we come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. Broke the bread, turned and shared it with his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup. He gave thanks to you. Turned and he shared it with his disciples and he said, Take, drink, this is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to extend your hands in front of you as we call on the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world. The body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ. One with each other and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus is always teaching us to pray. Say, our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
Friends, the table is ready. Come and receive what you are. Go and be what you receive.